My name is Chris Sunderick, and I have come here tonight to tell you a story. It's a story about love, a story about lies, about deceit and betrayal, and a story about science gone wrong. And this story is about this guy, a man named Paolo Macchiarini. Macchiarini, not too long ago, was considered one of the most famous surgeons in the world. And he became famous because he developed this bioengineered tracheal tra uh, transplant that was grown from patients' own cells. And this was considered a breakthrough in tissue engineering, a lab-grown organ grown from the patient's own cells so that there is no risk of immune rejection, except that it was all a lie. But let's start at the beginning. Macchiarini was born in Switzerland, but grew up with his parents in Italy. He earned his medical degree from the University of Pisa in 1986 and his PhD in France in 1997 in organ and tissue transplantation. He bounced around teaching positions at universities in Europe for a while, but eventually ended up as a researcher at the University of Barcelona. And that's really where this story starts, because while he's there, he does the first uh, transplant surgery using a cadaveric trachea. Now what that means is he uses a donor, a cadaver donor's uh, a trachea that's been decellularized, meaning it's been washed of the original owner's cellular material, just leaving the cartilaginous tissue behind. Then it's reseeded with the recipient patient's own stem cells isolated from their bone marrow and then transplanted back inside. And this is the first patient to receive this surgery. This, one's, this was considered a major breakthrough in tissue engineering, a field that for so long, since the discovery of stem cells, stem cells themselves, scientists have been trying to figure out how can we exploit this property that stem cells have to differentiate into more specialized cell types and tissue structures, eventually growing replaceable tissue and eventually replaceable organs in the lab. This was called the dawn of the stem cell revolution. First, we're doing windpipes. Next, it'll be kidneys, livers, and hearts. The beginning of the end of the organ donor transplant list. So this was a big deal at the time, and it earns him a position at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, Sweden. Now, if you've never heard of Karolinska, it's, a, it's considered the top university in Sweden, the equivalent of Oxford or Harvard. It's also home to the Nobel Assembly, the group of people that awards and chooses and awards the Nobel Prize in Physio uh, Physiology and Medicine every year. It is, without a doubt, one of the most important and prestigious research institutions in the world, and Macchiarini surgery earns him a position here. And it's here where he takes his research to the next level. Instead of using cadaveric tissue, which can vary in different shapes and sizes, he develops a technique to manufacture a, a, a tracheal scaffold from a biodegradable plastic. So first they take CAT scans of the patient and from those scans, they create a 3D model and they fabricate uh, that model using a porous biodegradable scaffold and then they seed that model with the patient's own bone marrow isolated stem cells. They sprinkle in some growth factors, and after a while, you have a transplantable tracheal tissue, a transplantable trachea that's made from the patient's own stem cells, no risk of immune injection, and no need to use expensive and damaging immunosuppressive drugs. This is the first person to receive this transplant, Adiamarium Bayen. He is an Eritrean native, but he's earning his PhD in Iceland. And he is given the sad news that he has a tumor in his windpipe. It is responding to radiation therapy very poorly, and it's too big to operate on. So he goes to Karolinska, and he's the first person to receive this transplant. Mysteriously, after the surgery, he gets transferred to a different hospital where the attending physicians can't follow up with him. But he recovers well and gets a lot of press coverage. This really elevates Macchiarini's status in this field. 
Not long after that, he performs the same surgery on another patient, an American man named Christopher Lyles. Again, very mysteriously, he's discharged early, goes back to the US, and sadly dies three months later. Nonetheless, another article gets written about it. Mr. Lyles returned home to Maryland in January, but died in March. Macchiarini said that the implant had been functioning well. Despite that setback, which is pretty generous term. In June, Macchiarini performed similar operations on two patients in Russia. Both have been discharged from the hospital and are doing well, he said. <laughs> and you see this all over and over again in the media around this time. Everyone just keeps taking him for his word. Everyone just hops on the Macchiarini bandwagon, and they're not that critical about what's really going on. And on top of that, he is still doing these surgeries, not just at Narolinska, but he's traveling to do them at institutions all over Europe. This is the first guy who really sounds the alarm about Macchiarini's work, Pierre Delaire, and he is a professor at the University of Leuven in Belgium. He's also a tracheal surgeon, so he's been following the field uh, very closely for his entire life, and he's especially been following Macchiarini's work. He writes a letter to the president of the Narolinska Institute imploring them to stop the surgeries. He cites countless animal models where similar surgeries have failed miserably. It just doesn't make sense that this kind of surgery would fail so miserably in animal models, but would perform so well in Macchiarini's patients. He says in the letter, we cannot find one word of evidence that points to regeneration induced by stem cells. And on a scientific level, this makes sense because synthetic materials alone can't secrete the necessary signals to get cells to cooperate with each other and form a functional unit. Nonetheless, Karolinska ignores the warning. Not too long after this, patients start returning to Narolinska, patients who had received the transplant, and their conditions are grave. This is an image of a normal windpipe. It's clear, it's healthy looking. This is an image of Bay Yen's windpipe a year after his surgery. It is scarred, it's infected, and it's clogged with mucus and blood. He and other patients who showed up experienced the same condition. The transplants are failing, collapsing. There are holes in them, they're infected. A couple of them have to, uh, have, to have their airways pumped of mucus and blood every three or four hours. It's agonizing. And this, these findings were shocking to a handful of relatively more junior researchers at Narolinska, namely these four guys. And we'll all take a minute to giggle at the third guy's name, but it's the gentleman at the very end who I really want to focus on, Carl Henrik Grinemo. I want to focus on him because he's essentially the ringleader of this group. He spearheads the charge to investigate Macchiarini internally. Now, what's important to know is that Macchiarini is kind of a mentor to Grinemo. He invites Grinemo to be a co-author on the original Bayen paper, the first transplant using a synthetic windpipe. And when Grinemo learns that Macchiarini invited him to be a co-author, he is thrilled. I mean, to be a co-author on a breakthrough paper like this is a really big deal. This can really elevate your career, and Grinemo is ecstatic about it. But the findings from Bayen and other patients were so shocking that Grinemo and his colleagues decide to launch their own investigation. They pour through metal, medical records, they contact the patient's families, and in the end, they write up a 400-page report detailing Macchiarini's fraud, and they submit it to Narolinska's administration. And this time, they didn't ignore it. They retaliated against them. They dragged these guys through the mud. First of all, Macchiarini finds out that he's being accused of research fraud, and he spreads rumors around about Grinemo. He files a formal ethical complaint against Grinemo, accusing him of stealing his data, 
which doesn't even make sense because Grinemo, Grinemo's field is in aortic valve regeneration, not tracheal regeneration. How can you have something stolen from you that you never possessed in the first place? Narolinska pulled promotions that were promised to these guys, and at one point they filed a police complaint against them, accusing them of violating patient privacy laws during their investigation. Meanwhile, Macchiarini is having a great time. <laughs> he is famous. NBC does a two-hour profile on Macchiarini called A Leap of Faith. The person on the left, that's Meredith Vieira. She's the host of the show and interviews Macchiarini uh, during the show and profiles his life, his work, and all of the patients that he's saved. But later that same year, word gets out that Grinemo and his colleagues are accusing Macchiarini of research fraud. The New York Times gets wind of it and they publish a story. And this is when the ground really starts to shake for Karolinska and for Macchiarini. But nothing really happens for the next year and a half or so. The administration basically just, just points inquiries into directions that don't lead anywhere. It's not until 2016 when the House of Cards finally starts to fall down. That's when a Swedish television channel did a documentary about Macchiarini, exposing his research fraud, the lives that he took and ruined, and the pain of those patients' families. And this really sends Karolinska and Macchiarini scrambling into damage control mode. But oddly enough, this was not the final nail in the coffin. That would be this article published in Vanity Fair magazine. <laughs> the celebrity surgeon who used love, money, and the Pope to scam an NBC news producer. <laughs> when Benita Alexander fell for celebrated Dr. Paolo Macchiarini while filming a documentary about him, she thought her biggest problem was a breach of journalistic ethics. Then, things got really interesting. <laughs> And they did. See, Alexander was a producer for NBC. In fact, the same producer that worked with Meredith Vieira on that NBC profile. And during the filming, she developed a secret romance with Macchiarini. They went on dinner dates after shoots. She fell in love, and they got engaged. Now, Macchiarini was already a world-renowned surgeon. That he didn't need to make up. What he did make up, for some reason, was that he was the personal doctor to the Pope. <laughs> Not only was he the personal doctor to the Pope, but he was also a member of this small, secret, elite group of doctors that were regularly summoned by world leaders and dignitaries around the world. He and the Pope were apparently so close, so tight, that the Pope agreed to officiate their wedding. There are a couple of things wrong with this story. <laughs> One, doesn't actually know the Pope. Two, he's already married and has been for some time. And three, he lives with his mistress. <laughs> so, and by the way, I mentioned that he claimed to be part of this secret group of doctors that knew all these world leaders, so that brings us to the guest list for this wedding. This is, this is one of the invitations that were made up. It is printed on lambskinned lamb sheathed invitation cards, and as you can see, it is made out to Barack Obama, President of the United States, and Michelle Obama, the First Lady of the United States. He had invitation cards made up for not just the Obamas, but the Clintons, the Sarkozy's, Vladimir Putin, Kofi Annan, Sir Elton John, <laughs> Russell Crowe for some reason, <laughs> Kenny Rogers. You know, the global elite. So. <laughs> oh. So, how did she finally find out that Macchiarini had been lying to her? Because a friend of hers sent her a link to the Pope's schedule 
which is publicly available on the Vatican website, and wouldn't you know, he's in South America at the wedding date. Which I have to imagine what that conversation was like. Hey, I was just uh, checking out the Vatican website like I usually do and couldn't help but notice your wedding's not on the schedule. So she confronts him about this and he's like, look, the Pope and I are really tight. He's going to cut the trip short and he'll be there for the wedding. Don't you worry. <laughs> Fortunately, she doesn't believe him this time and hires a private investigator who finally shows her that Indeed, he does not know the Pope, uh, and he has a wife, and he lied about everything. <laughs> she would actually make a documentary about her experience that was released last year, aptly titled, He Lied About Everything. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's the Vanity Fair piece, along with the Swedish documentary exposing Macchiarini, that finally brings him down. Do you think he got what he deserved? Of course not! Karolinska finally launches their own investigation, and they clear him of scientific misconduct charges. In the report, they say that his handling of, this, of his uh, patients was a little sloppy. And he is cleared of, but he's cleared of charges anyway. There is a massive public outcry about this in Sweden. People want heads to roll, and for the most part, they do. The president resigns, the dean of research, uh, multiple professors and top officials, some of whom are on the Nobel panel. Eventually, the entire board gets replaced, and Macchiarini is just seen as too radioactive to keep on the payroll, and he is finally fired. And what about these guys? Do you think they got they, th what they deserved? No, of course not. In the same uh, investigation launched by Karolinska, Granemo is found to share the blame with Macchiarini because he was a co-author on that Bayen paper, an authorship that he gladly accepted because he thought it would advance his career. As for everybody else, including Granemo, None of them ever got a grant proposal approved again. They were so poisoned just by their proximity to the whole affair that they could not get one krona of research funding ever again. Not even Thomas Fox. <laughs> so Macchiarini, he gets kicked out of Karolinska, but gets awarded a grant from the Russian Science Foundation and takes up a position at the University of Kazan. Uh, there, he does, a he does the same surgeries on baboons. But I don't think he's there for more than a year before he's fired by Kazan, in part due to a 57-page petition that's written to the University of Kazan and the Russian Science Foundation imploring them to investigate Macchiarini's past. And guess who are the authors of that report? It's your boys! <laughs> yeah, they may have had their lives and careers ruined by Macchiarini, but they weren't going to let him do research ever again, whether on humans or primates or anything else. So, what's Macchiarini up to these days? Well, uh, this was a, one of the last TV interviews he ever did for an Icelandic TV station. This is filmed in 2017, sometime after he got fired. Uh, this is towards the end of the interview. Uh, he's talking about his baboon research. Listen to what he says when the interviewer asks him, so what are you doing these days? Can we play the clip? We finally decided, thanks to a grant from the Russian Science Foundation, to um, use the non-human primate model as non-human primates as a model. Now we have 1.5 years for that, so that uh, we have sufficient data to well make an analysis and move forward. We are meeting now here in Spain, mm -hmm. close to where you live. Mm -hmm. um, you are going to Russia in a couple of days mm -hmm. for an operation. Where do you work now? Well, um, I, uh, 
I um, am asked to do the surgeries around, um, so I'm a freelancer. <laughs> I'm a surgeon and coming from Turkey, now going to Russia and uh, wherever it is possible that we do that. Okay. <laughs> freelance surgeon? Has anyone ever heard of a freelance surgeon? That is so sketchy. That sounds like a euphemism for someone who harvests organs from living people. And actually, I wouldn't put it past him. Also, I like how he says at the end, wherever I can do it, I'll do it. For example, freelance surgery hotspots like Turkey and Russia. <laughs> so how did this happen? How was he allowed to get away with all of this for so long and cause so much damage? Well, for one, there were some bureaucratic, uh, bureaucratic vulnerabilities that he ex uh, exploited. So in order to get an experimental treatment like this, there are a couple of conditions that need to be met. One, it has to be a life or death situation. So here in the US at least, and in a lot of other places, uh, if you're a cancer patient and you have exhausted all approved therapies for your cancer, then you can get approved for an experimental clinical trial and take experimental drugs. In Sweden, this is called a hospital exemption. So you can get approved for uh, experimental treatments as long as you have exhausted every other option. On top of that, there need to be animal studies showing that this treatment works. And Macchiarini lied repeatedly and claimed that both conditions were met in order to get hospital exemptions for his patients. Second was money and reputation. Macchiarini was bringing in millions in research funding for Karolinska, and they didn't want to get rid of that. Also, they're you know, one of the top medical research institutions in the world, and they didn't want to be plagued by scandal. So they tried to cover it up. On top of that, they were trying to open a campus in Hong Kong that was being funded by uh, a wealthy Chinese businessman, which itself is its whole, it, the whole affair is a, another story. The son of that businessman was awarded a research grant at Karolinska. It was kind of a quid pro quo thing, super corrupt. But finally, he was repeatedly enabled over the course of years, not just by Karolinska, but by journals who published his work without being critical of it, and by the media as well, who published article after article documentary after documentary, claiming that this was a breakthrough, this was the next revolution. And it wasn't. So how can we prevent something like this from happening again? Well, for one, we need to protect whistleblowers. And that's a hard thing to do, because if you are, if you express concern about one of your superiors, for example, and if you're legitimately wrong, that's bad for you. And if you're right, it's still bad for you. In 2017, Sweden passed their first whistleblower protection law. Second, maybe it's time to have an international regulating body that keeps an eye on journals and makes sure that, uh, and you know, a, a body that can detect and penalize journals that, uh, that publish faulty research or you know, penalize scientists that commit research fraud. And look, I don't know what that looks like, but there has to be something better than the decentralized way that we still do science today. And speaking of how we do science, I also think it's time to have a really honest but maybe difficult discussion about the structure and the culture in academia. One that, thank you, one that enables huge power imbalances where if the lower on the totem pole you are, the more dependent you are on the people above you for recommendation letters, for endorsements, for authorships. There has to be a better way to do this. Science is slow and expensive, and that's why we need to be honest about our work, both its successes and its failures. Thank you.
Go to nerdnight.com to find a Nerd Night event near you. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel for our latest presentation.